We're running a bit late, but the, here's the last presentation, which we're now doing in the room. Uh, they're presenting on an issue that's quite active in the Cellular Working Group uh, on, um, you know, what is needed in digital containers and uh, digital encodings uh, to help tolerate film. Uh, so this involves a lot of work in color, and uh, it's been quite interesting that like this work touches upon uh, the management of like you know some of the the, the newest media like the classroom that the of very modern standards that's going into YouTube as well as some of the very oldest media uh, the work of uh, digitized film. Uh, so after this last uh, presentation, we'll give you a little bit of information on uh, what is happening tomorrow, and then we'll take a break and meet for for dinner. Thank you, Dave. Uh, as the last uh, presentation today, we present something that could be uh, useful in the future for the archives, for the film archives, but also for archives that need to have high uh, quality of the data that are stored in the archive. And uh, I do a little introduction, and then Kieran will do a presentation, a live presentation of the things we are currently thinking about. It's about the ways to store DPX content into the FFV1 codec to code uh, the, the content of DPX inside FFV1. And that uh, is, in my opinion, a good idea. And it's a good idea because I am a, a company that provides digitalization and our internal archive has now two formats. One format is FFV1 with the Matroshka wrapper, and we use that for video type material and for a single image material that comes more from the um, cinema world. We need to find a solution. We now work with Open EXR that is used in the um, special effect industry because we need a wider range of uh, colors and so on for our work. But the DPX is a format that is used in many, many archives in Europe as a preservation format. But the problem is that uh, usually we don't know or we don't know exactly what's, what is inside DPX. And here is a list of some of the things that we are going to discuss tomorrow more in detail. There are different ways to encode information inside a thing called DPX. The starting point is the Cineon format made by Kodak for the first uh, scanners. And uh, this format was designed to match the goal to have a digital intermediate. So it was never designed for preservation. It was designed as one step in between the camera and the reel that is projected in the cinema. And the digital intermediate process was supposed to be a temporary. But this format had some evolutions, and uh, this kind of evolution uh, will be one of the challenges that we have to discuss about uh, for the implementation. There are other points that uh, have been mentioned today, for instance, by Kate, the metadata issue. Uh, Kieran will make a nice presentation about, about that and we hope uh, really that in the version 4 for FFV1 we can implement some additional formats that can much better uh, deal with this and also with formats that are based on higher filtering. I'm not going to speak about that today. Um, here I have just some formulas of logarithmic coding. The first line is uh, MPEG with H264 with uh, 360 to 1 range. The second one is normalized to 100. And the last one is one that we have often in the real world that has a clipping. So we have to find ways to know if our uh, uh, numbers our zeros and ones are clipped or not, and uh, which uh, represents.
implementation is used. Then we have some quasi log coding that are the coding that are used today by the cameras, ARRI log for uh, instance, or uh, S log for Sony log, and so on, that use this kind of approach usually. And we have the first one here is uh, again the statistical that avoids clipping. Then we have the actual values that are calculated by silicon imaging for the SI log 90 and the thin stream that it's ARI log F version that's uh, log 60. So that's uh, some numbers and that's a very different kind of, uh, of uh, representation that has to go back to the monitor if you don't wish to see a flat image but the correct <coughs> image with the right uh, values. And I will not spend uh, words about FFV1 because many people have to say much more, but uh, I invite you tomorrow to participate actively in the discussion how we could and which format we should consider for our implementation in FFV1 if this is the direction to go. And that is all for my part, and I Great. So, cool. Okay, so my name is Kieran O'Leary. I work in digital collections in the iFi Irish Film Archive. Um, so, I was going to originally just show some slides and things like that, but it's kind of nice to see what FFV1 can do right now for RGB because we generally think of it as a Way CBCR format, maybe for tape. There's a lot of examples of it working really well for tape. But um, as was brought up a few times earlier on today, there is now some talk of what can we do with RGB. And the IFI, I'm doing another talk on uh, in on the last day. I'll go in more about the context of why this would be really important for us. But long and short, of it, this is a great way to use an open format. Um, to dramatically reduce the size of our files, and as Peter mentioned earlier, the real severe kind of infrastructure issues that can come from dealing with massive image sequences versus single files. So I'm kind of just going to get cracking here. We're going to look at the media info readout um, of our TPX file, so that's, which is called log.tpx. Okay, so. We've got some significant properties here. The ones to look out for are RGB. Um, most people in this room who probably use FFV1 would be seeing YUV here. Um, 10 bit, DaVinci, and the thing I want to call your attention to here is the color primaries value. Um, sometimes you'll find a file that will also have transfer characteristics, I think. Um, so it's printing density here, as, as um, Rito mentioned earlier, that's relating to the Cineon log format. and Actually, the scanner that we have in the Irish Film Archive doesn't write anything, doesn't write a metadata value here at all. It's just blank. So let's very quickly just turn that file into FFV1. So there's much easier ways of creating FFV1 files, but I want to be as transparent as possible here um, and just show you all the features that I'm enabling. So I'm just going to say. <coughs> Could you scroll the window up a bit so we can oh. see the bottom end of my Okay, so 
So I'll call it something unimaginative like ff31.dpx. But as was mentioned in the first lightning talk, um, sorry, I can't remember your name. But, uh, but just about the uh, frame MD5 verification. So for me, and I think some other archives, um, FFV1 is almost like a three-step process where you're encoding your video, but then you're running some sort of lossless verification um, mechanism. So what I'm going to use here is frame MD5. Um, so if this was like a really long video or a massive image sequence, this would have, it would decode your video to raw video. Um, and it would give you a MD5 checksum for every single frame. So this is just one single frame that I'm working with now. Um, oh, thank you, Dave. F and then let's just say, this is for the source, dpx.md5. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's done two things, dpx to ffv1, and it's also decoded the dpx to raw video in order to generate that checksum. So let's take a quick look at that frame md5 output. So there's lots of stuff here, but what we want to pay attention to is this hash. Okay, so that's all okay so far. Um, so let's take a look at the ffv1 file. Actually, first let's just look at the file size difference. So our 12.6 megabyte file is now down to 5 megabytes. So it's about a 2.5 time saving. Now this isn't, this is going to fluctuate dramatically. I've seen savings of, I've seen compression ratios of 4 and 5 to 1 for RGB. We overscan our films in the Irish Film Archive in order to take in the perforation area and the optical track. That area compresses really well. Um, really vibrant uh, Kodachrome that fills up the whole screen, uh, compresses as much less, it's like two to one, I, I found, but uh, we haven't um, encoded a massive amount in our tests. So 2.5, three to one is generally kind of like a rule of thumb for lossless compression in a way. So let's look at what that median is looking like for the FFV1. Sorry, you can tell I'm a, um, dot MKB. Hey, you named oh. it .dpx. Ah, okay. I meant to do, uh, yeah, let's just run that one again, the first one. Um, so we'll put it in the Matrosa container instead. Okay. That would have been really confusing. Um, okay. So there is no information here right now about things like the color primaries. Is it log? Is it linear? Printing density? Um, it looks very similar to a regular, um, uh, like, uncompressed 10-bit file or something like that. So that's maybe the first issue right now with FFV1, that um, these kind of values aren't uh, carried over. But I was thinking more about what Kate was saying, um, and I heard another actor as well, who was Eric Peel, was saying that he's thinking about um, embedding some process history metadata into the DPX. And so that kind of thing isn't going to transfer over now either. Uh, so that's something else that maybe we should think about. Okay, so this FFE1.mkv, if you wanted to do some restoration work later on, want to take it out of your LTO system, maybe put it through DaVinci Resolve or something, what we're going to do is reconstruct it as a DPX. So let just say MPEG, now our input is ffv one Okay. And we'll just say, uh, what are we like? Uh, just output dot dpx. So now we've got another output dot dpx, 12.6 megabytes, same as um, our original log dot dpx. And just uh, um, let's just take a frame MD5 of the two. So. And let's call it output.md5. Because if you got like a whole file checksum of this now, you just put it through md 5 sum, it's going to be different because there'll be slightly different metadata. Um, but what we want is that our actual image um, information needs to be identical for it to be lossless. 
So output time d5 is like this. And then here's our source. Okay, it's already open. Okay, you can kind of see there, the hashes are the same. Okay, so it's a lossless process, right? Um, however, it's probably not suitable right now for long-term preservation. And the reason for that is, in our reconstructed DPX file, let's run it through media info, fantastic media info. Um, Our significant property, everything's fine. We know that the bits are actually identical, they decode the same way, but our color primaries value now has turned into linear. <coughs> so, what I found is um, I've never actually encountered a file where a color primary says logarithmic, it's always either printing density, linear, or uh, nothing. It's just the scanned files that we've been dealing with. So, um, even when there's absolutely nothing there, when you reconstruct it, FFmpeg will always write this linear value. And so just to clarify, this is something separate from the image data. The image data is lossless. We can reconstruct it perfectly from the original. And this is a metadata flag that it's like a hint for um, a tool like um, Resolve or Avid or something like that to know um, how to display the colors correctly. What's the correct transformation? What's the right LUT to put on this? So, I, um, before actually, when I was testing this stuff out, um, I was really happy that the frame MD5 matched. And then when I opened it up in media info, it was actually Christoph Gertzbauer, I think, raised from Noah. He raised an issue on FFmpeg user. And I was so deflated when I saw this, because I thought this was, like, it, it would have been so perfect. And I just never noticed it, because I was actually putting linear files through anyway. So um, I just stopped here, and I didn't put it through something like Resolve, or media composer or something like that and see what actually happened. So I have some um, screenshots here of what happened when I put it through media composer. Well, I didn't bother doing anything with Resolve because um, Resolve just treats that original source file straight from your scanner and that FFV1, um, the reconstructed DPX files, treats them identically. Um, it doesn't even read the color primaries flag. It doesn't apply any default LUT on it or anything. It just, um, it lets it up to you. You pick the correct one. So there's nothing much to really show there. So now I'm going to show why um, the flag actually is important for certain tools. Obviously, it's important from a cataloging uh, standpoint as well. It's important um, just, you know, FFE1 kind of prides itself as being a self descriptive codec. And this is a misleading piece of metadata. It's incorrect for the moment, unless you have a linear source. So I'm um, just. I'll back a bit here and show some screenshots of what happened. Okay. So hopefully that's somewhat clear. So this is an example from our scanner. You can't actually tell there, but that's got extreme color fade and it should be extremely red in the gensa. But it's just that's a we chose the Cineon printing density setting. However, our scanner doesn't write that metadata flag, so it just ignores it. So, oh yeah, so when, Avid, um, when you bring this in, it looks like this. It's not putting any transformations on because it doesn't find that flag. So this is what it looks like by default. And this is what happens when you bring in that reconstructed FFB1 uh, DPX file. So you can see the histograms have moved on significantly. It's a much flatter image. It's wrong as well. You know? And here's why. It's looked through, is there a color primary? Yes, the value is linear. So color transformations, it's applying a linear to rec 709 logic. So we've confused that bit. Now if you take that off, this is what that DPX, that's how it's going to be rendered by Abbott. Um, so it's actually identical to the source. So here's a different example. A more extreme one. Um, Resolve handles this stuff really, really well. It's a really good piece of software. Avid is quite poor for um, for log anyway. This was something we got externally telescoped at um, with the Spirit scanner. It had the printing density value. 
and color primaries. Um, so Abbott went through, it found printing density, steady on, and it decided that this was the accurate way to treat it. So it did two transformations. It turned printing density to linear, and then from linear to Rec 709. And you can see it's destroyed the image. The whites are blown out, the blacks are crushed, the colors are oversaturated. Um, when you take these off, though, this is what it looks like in VLC or FFA or something. Um, it's not a very loud looking image, actually. It's not as washed out as how we'd expect. So, same story again. This is the reconstructed. Um, we've squashed it down to FFB1 and brought it back out to GPX. Of course, the linear flag is there, so it's going to do that thing again with the linear to Rex 709. But what's interesting is that Avid messes up the source anyway. They got it wrong. They made the wrong guess uh, because the metadata misled it. So, um, you rectify that by taking off the default and then adding on whatever the correct LUT or whatever the correct transformation is. Unfortunately, um, any LUT that we applied to this image didn't really produce an, anything looking what it would have looked like on a steam deck or something like that. Um, there was no preset really. We kind of, our um, telecine officer, Gavin Martin, uh, would have had to grade it manually. So when you took off the um, took off the default color transformation from that FFB1, it looked identical. So, one of the reasons I really wanted to show this was that, um, just to maybe clear up the confusion about the kind of, the reason why the frame and D5s look identical, but then the images looked completely different when you open them up and out. So, as Rito mentioned, and we're gonna talk about it more tomorrow, um, there's other issues, like there's no 16-bit support right now, there's no raw uh, Bayer support. But in regards to this particular issue, um, this should be fixable. Um, FFV1 needs to be able to write the correct values for color primaries. But also, there's an issue with FFmpeg and how it creates DPX files, uh, which is a separate issue, I think. Um, no matter what, it's always going to say linear, so you're always going to have that issue. So if part of your workflow if you're going to use RGB, um, FFV1, and it requires this color primary value, if part of that workflow involves reconstructing the DPX, then this will probably have to be fixed. So, um, Peter mentioned earlier on that um, there were some features missing in FFV1 originally that were really uh, favorable to Archivus and for these files to be preserved long term. And I think the way around that was just funding was, um, was sourced from multiple uh, institutions. And in my opinion, there's incredible potential for FFV1 to be a film scanning um, format. Um, it, we may even get to a point where if enough hardware manufacturers of scanners are lobbied, we could be scanning directly to FFV1 and the space savings would be really, really significant. And it's, look, we all know it's a fantastic open format to begin with. So, I'd like everyone to maybe think about going into tomorrow is, is this something that interests you? I've spoken to a few people already and it sounds like RGB FFV1 is interesting to them. Um, how significant this particular issue is right now? Is this a deal breaker for you? Um, there's part of me is thinking, I'm so tempted to almost recommend that we proceed regardless in my archive um, because we have a tiny staff, tiny budget, and I know now that we can treat these files the same way we treat the source um, in these post-production tools. It's just, uh, I probably think it's too risky in the grand scheme of things. That metadata flag is misleading to humans and machines. So maybe we'll probably hold back, but it's really, really tempting. So just think about, is it something that really matters to you? Is it something that you think that maybe you'd like to invest in? When you factor up the cost savings that can come from losslessly compressing your files um, versus contributing to open source software, because all of us use open source software one way or another here, and it's, there's so many different ways to give back. You can be an advocate for open source. Uh, you can test open source, but sometimes you just need to fund it. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so, thanks. Any questions? Bye. So, we there. Uh,
saw a primary element was added to the trust test recently. Um, so you can specify uh, various color primaries. Are the color primaries specified there not uh, not relevant to the color primaries that are needed for the GPS scan? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I, I didn't know that that feature was actually, I mean, it can FFmpeg like, actually write? It's just enabled in FFmpeg like that. Last week. Well, I, I don't know if it's in that time tag, I just know the trust for itself mm -hmm. has the, the color primaries, the transfer function. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing a patch, but it's, just, it's very, very recent. Yeah. I mean, also, it would be preferable if this was defined at the codec level. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, one of the real benefits of FFE1 is that it is self descriptive, it doesn't leave liquid ABI. Um, I'm pretty sure it's aspect ratio and interlacement. Are both up to the container? Oh. No, they're in the application. Yeah, sorry, yeah, so you, yeah, they're described by the codec. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't feel comfortable if it was just the trust that was supporting that. Any questions for Rito as well? I'm actually just curious, the show of hands. Um, is anybody here actually considered lossless compression for some of your scans? Okay. So I think we should definitely um, talk tomorrow. This will be good. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you very much. Okay, that's the end of the first day of the conference.